Hello, everyone. Hello. It's great to see such a tremendous uh, crowd here. What I'm going to do is just ask people, if you have an empty seat next to you, can you just raise your hand so one of these nice people sitting along the sides, standing along the sides can actually rest? Keep them up until you get somebody. Hello. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Anybody know what that's all about? Welcome back. All right, we've still got a seat over here. Seat over here. Go grab it. Don't be shy. Otherwise, feel free to make yourselves comfortable along the stage, in the aisles, wherever you are. Okay, thank you. Again, welcome. I'm um, Brian Hansen, and I welcome you to this uh, event on behalf of One Book Northwestern, as well as the Buffett Center for International and Comparative Studies. I am the... Um, one book faculty director and also the interim director at the Buffett Center. And I'm just really thrilled to be here tonight for this event. As many of you know, at Northwestern this year, uh, we have a one book that was uh, given to all of the freshmen and, uh, and also on which we're doing programming for the entire year. And the, the book is written by Roger Thoreau and it's called The Last Hunger Season, A Year in an African Farm Community on the Brink of Change. And it's really a, a wonderful um, intersection between that book and tonight's talk. Because what Roger does so well in that book is he paints a very human picture of four farm families who live in rural Kenya and what their daily life is about. And this is a, this is a, um, a, a poor part of the world. Uh, these, these folks are farmers, subsistence farmers. And one of the seasons in the year has a local name, Wanjala, which means the hunger season. And it lasts between four, three, four months typically. It starts in the, in the winter, January, February, and it, it doesn't end until the harvest in midsummer. And one of the things that, that Roger does in this book is just gives you a chance to see what people's lives are and to see the decisions they make about whether to, um, whether to spend their money on food, whether to pay school fees, whether to have one of their kids treated for malaria. And he does it not in a sensationalistic way, but in a very, in a very human and, a, and approachable way. The other thing that the book is about is about a Northwestern graduate, Andrew Yoon, who, faced with this reality in the world, decided to start an organization called the One Acre Fund to try to improve the livelihoods of rural farmers. Uh, he started in Western Kenya with about 60 families. Today, there are 250,000 families with One Acre, and he plans to go to a million. And as we were thinking about what to do for programming around this book, one of the themes that came out immediately was what is our responsibility in a world that has such struggles, uh, such inequities in it? We come from a place of, of great prosperity. And in order to ask that question and really challenge all of us to think about uh, what our role is in this world, the first name that popped up was that of our, our guest tonight, um, Peter Singer. Many of you are, are familiar uh, with his book. As a matter of fact, I teach some of his stuff in my classes. Uh, there was a very popular book that came out recently, The Life You Can Save, Acting Now to End World Poverty. And Professor Singer is a professor of bioethics at the University Center for Human Values in Princeton University. He also has an appointment as a laureate professor um, at the University of Melbourne, where he's associated with the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. Uh, he's originally from Australia, Melbourne. He was uh, educated there at the University of Melbourne and also Oxford University. And over the course of a, a very long and active career, um, he's become one of the leading voices uh, about um, bioethics. Um, many people uh, cite some of his early work on animal rights as a founding moment in the animal rights movement. And one of the things that's very true of Professor Singer is he has not been shy or, and, and not been hesitant to follow his ideas to their logical conclusions, even when some of those conclusions have been uh, very controversial and people have been pushed back against it. Um, he has, 
engaged the world, not only is in the academic world, but he engaged, has engaged the world in, in many ways, including running for political office. Time magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And tonight, he's going to speak to us about effective altruism, what it is, and why we should do it. Please join me in welcoming Peter Singer. Thank you very much, Brian. It's uh, great to be here, and it's great to see such a full attendance on a rainy night as well. So um, there's quite a lot to get through, um, so I'll move straight into this without further ado, and uh, we are going to have, I want to leave a reasonable amount of time for questions, so if you have questions and thoughts that occur to you as I go, please uh, hold on to them until we get to question time. So what is effective altruism? why we should do it. I'm actually going to start with an image of some of the people who are doing it. Here are a few of them. I'm going to, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of them, but I don't have time to tell you about all of it. So people who are involved in effective altruism are, as you can see, people just like you and just like many of the people here in this audience who, for one reason or another, have decided that they want to act altruistically and they want to do that in a way that is effective. And I'm going to say a little bit more about both of those things. Um, where did this start? Well, it's hard to say exactly. There's many possibilities. But one of the first people that I heard about um, who was certainly acting with a great amount of altruism is this person, Zell Kravinsky, who I read about in this article in The New Yorker back in 2004. Uh, Zell not only gave away a considerable fortune, most of the money that he had earned, um, but he was not satisfied with that, um, realizing that there are people who die every day in the United States because they cannot get a kidney, uh, decided that he didn't really need to have two kidneys. Most Your chances are pretty good that you're going to function uh, well with one kidney, so he decided to give one of those away. And... I suppose it's probably more that than the money donation that got him written up in the New Yorker. But it's certainly an interesting thing to think about in terms of how far do our responsibilities to help others really go. And I think Zell started doing that. Um, another figure more, if you like, part of the contemporary movement in terms of building this, and I think effective altruism is a movement, is Toby Ord, who... Uh, at the time when he was a graduate student in philosophy at the University of Oxford, he's now a research fellow, um, calculated that um, with the money he was likely to earn over his career, and he was just thinking of a career as an academic, not a high-flying career in finance or anything like that, um, he calculated that uh, if he lived on a reasonable amount, he chose this figure of 18,000 pounds, about $28,000. If he lived on that, then the money that he earned would enable him to donate to a charity which helped prevent blindness or cure easily curable cases of blindness in developing countries. And he would be, could be responsible for preventing or curing 80,000 cases of blindness during his lifetime. And he was impressed by that figure and decided not only that that was what he wanted to do, but that he wanted to tell more people about it. So he started an organization called Giving What We Can, uh, which has played a, a seminal role in this effective altruism movement. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. And here are some of the people who uh, work with Giving What We Can. Sally Murray, for example, is also pledged to uh, planning to live on this 18,000 pounds. At the moment, she's on a much smaller income, just a, uh, a student stipend, really, um, doing her master's. Uh, but she plans to... to so she, but she's still giving 10% despite that. And she also works as a volunteer and is thinking of a career in international development. Uh, why is that not moving? Right. And here's somebody else who's actually donating rather less because she's rather harder up, but she's giving 
a lot more time. She's planning to intern for 10 months with giving what we can and will receive just living expenses for that. Uh, will McCaskill is somebody who's also worked with uh, Toby Ord in founding Giving What We Can, but, uh, and he's a, a graduate student at Oxford at the moment, um, but he's also founded this uh, website, 80,000 Hours, which uh, is advising people on ethical career choices. And uh, so if you're interested in choosing an ethical career, um, this is a website to go to. And you might be surprised to know that although it sets out a lot of alternatives, it's not only talking about choosing a career in international development or aid or becoming a doctor and going to Africa to help people. Um, Will also considers the impact that you can have by going into careers that a lot of people who think about living ethically might not even contemplate. For example, going into finance and earning a lot of money in finance. And the reason that he thinks about that is if you have the right temperament to do this, then you'll be able to give away much more than you would be able to give away if you had some other kind of occupation. And perhaps the amount of money you give away, if you give it away effectively, can actually do more good than you could do yourself if you become a charity worker. So that's part of the debate about effective altruism is about career choice and there are a wider range of possible careers than you might at first imagine that can be arguably highly effective in uh, making the world a better place. So here's somebody who's actually following uh, Will's advice. Uh, Matt Wager is a, was a student of mine at Princeton a couple of years ago and uh, did extremely well, actually. He got the philosophy department's prize for the best senior thesis of his year. So he could have gone on to graduate school and uh, perhaps had a career as, a, as an academic. He decided, though, that, in fact, he would go into finance in New York City. He's, uh, just a year after that, he's earning enough to uh, give away $100,000 a year, obviously living rather more modestly than some of his colleagues, in the same area, um, but he finds that he's, it, that leaves him with quite enough to live on. And he also helped me as a volunteer to set up uh, my own website, which has the same title as the book that I wrote on this topic, The Life You Can Save, which you can see here. Um, it asks people to pledge to uh, contribute a proportion of their income to helping the global poor. So you can take a look, the, 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 the landing page has actually changed since I made that slide, so it's not exactly the same, but it has the same basic ideas. Here's someone else who is following this, this idea, Ada Wan, is somebody who um, has worked for AmeriCorps with the urban poor, um, but has now decided that she's going to try and increase her earning potential by getting an MBA at Yale and also then give away everything above a basic minimum. And here's someone else who, though much younger than Zell Kravinsky, also decided that uh, he thought donating a kidney to a stranger is the right thing to do, um, as well as working for GiveWell, an organization that I'm going to be talking about when I get to the effectiveness part of this talk, giving away a significant part of his income. Um, and again, he's somebody who comes to this out of philosophy. And it's, uh, I think, interesting that a lot of the people involved in effective altruism do have a background in philosophy. Um, I think it shows for those who think that philosophy is something that's just abstract and up there in the clouds and has no connection with the real world, that that is definitely not the case. Of course, I'm not saying that the people that... I'm talking about a representative sample of everybody in effective altruism. They're clearly not. Uh, some of them are people that I know personally precisely because they were involved in philosophy. But um, I do think that there is a connection. And here's another person who's donated a kidney. I don't know Chris Croy. I've never actually met him, but he wrote to me uh, just a few months ago 
saying that, uh, again, because of a course that he had taken at uh, St. Louis Community College, uh, he decided to donate a kidney to a stranger. Um, he's also an ethical vegan. Uh, concern about the suffering of animals is uh, another part of effective altruism for many of the people in it. I'll talk about that in a moment too. And though he doesn't have any spare income at the moment, he's hoping to be able to donate when he gets to the point where he does have. And here perhaps are the three most effective altruists in, uh, in all of history, um, Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, who have given more than any philanthropists, even when you adjust for inflation. Uh, they have given more than John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie. And I think one could argue that they have thought harder about how to do that effectively. Certainly Bill and Melinda Gates have thought very hard about that. And Warren Buffett, I think, just decided, well, um, there are a couple of very smart people who are thinking hard about what's the best way to give your money effectively, so why should I have to think hard about that myself? I'll just give it to them. And if you want to know sort of, well, why are they, uh, why do they do this? Um, where does this come from? This is a good way of seeing, I think, what the underlying ethical basis of this is. You go to their website of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you get this idea. All lives have equal value, um, which is a slogan and has some of the drawbacks of the slogan. I guess philosophers can certainly take it apart and question it. But... Um, one of the things that they say is, one of the things that moved them to set up the foundation and in particular to work to try to find ways of preventing or curing diseases that affect the poor in developing countries is that they were shocked to find that um, there are millions of children who die each year from easily preventable or easily curable Diseases, diseases like diarrhea, which people get in this country but don't die from. Diseases like malaria, uh, which can be prevented largely and if not can be cured, though at more cost. Or um, diseases like measles that everybody here is immunized against but not everybody in developing countries is immunized against. So um, given that a child's life can be saved for far, far less than we spend on saving the lives of children, or adults for that matter, in the healthcare system in this country. If we think that all lives are equal value, we don't think that a life is less valuable because it's the life of a person in Malawi or Bangladesh uh, than the life of a person in the United States. Then um, the idea that uh, we are spending so little that there are lives that can be saved for so little, things that are not hugely significant amounts to us, does suggest that this is something we ought to be doing something about as a matter of urgency. And that is what the Gates and Buffett have done. Now, let's look at some more of these people who are doing this and some of the, one of the other issues, as I mentioned. There are, there are people who think that the suffering of non-human animals is important as well as the suffering of humans, and that in fact we can more cheaply reduce the suffering of non-human animals than we can the suffering of animals, that, that there are ways of doing that effectively. So here's Brian Tomasek, who works for Microsoft and is donating 50% of what he earns, mostly to organizations that he thinks are cost-effectively targeting uh, animal suffering, particularly the suffering of factory farmed animals, which is by far the largest number of animals who are suffering as a result of things that we are doing. So Brian is contributing to reduce that. So is Pablo Staffarini, uh, an Argentinian who uh, went to Oxford, again studied philosophy, um, uh, and uh, is giving about 50% of, of his income to reduce animal suffering, and is also working for the organization I mentioned before, 80,000 hours. And uh, Ben West, uh, developing software, um, is living on the minimum wage and is actually giving away uh, even substantially more than 
He thinks that a very effective cause is the development of in vitro meat production. That is to be able to grow meat at the cellular level, to take individual cells and culture them uh, in labs so that they turn into meat and therefore we don't need to raise animals and kill them in order to obtain meat. And he sees two advantages in that. One is a reduction of animal suffering. The other is environmental benefits because livestock is a very major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, therefore to climate change. And there are studies showing that in vitro meat production would dramatically reduce the greenhouse gas uh, footprint of meat. And uh, if that's what's required in order to get people to avoid it, if simply appealing them to, to stop eating it is not going to be effective with enough people, then clearly uh, finding an effective replacement which eliminates animal suffering and eliminates the environmental damage of meat production would be highly beneficial. And here's the person who I think, uh, as far as I'm aware, holds the record for the largest percentage of his income that he gives away. Um, as you see, he's working on uh, developing computer games for which he's paid around $200,000 a year. He's living in this very simple, uh, in a single room in this uh, uh, rather cheap area of San Francisco on around $9,000 a year. So you can do the sums. He's basically giving away about 95% of uh, what he's earning, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so, uh, and he's, um, he's also giving it uh, partly to reduce animal suffering and partly to provide contraception in areas where it's not otherwise available, both in order to ensure that women have a choice about how many children they have and also because he thinks the growing human population is going to be a major long-term problem for everyone. So these are some of the people who are part of the effective altruism movement. I think you'll agree that they're very impressive. Why are they doing this? I've given you some reasons already, but I think underlying it really is something like this idea, which I've taken as a quote from a philosopher that those of you who are not doing philosophy have probably never heard of. Henry Sidgwick was a 19th century English utilitarian, wrote a large book called The Methods of Ethics. Um, if you want to study one of the great utilitarians, my recommendation is don't read John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism. This is a much better book, philosophically speaking. It is a longer book and a somewhat drier book, and that's probably why people do tend to read, or of course professors tend to set Mill's Utilitarianism as a text. But Sidgwick is the better philosopher. Anyway, so here's the thought, right? That you look at the, you look at the world from a kind of detached point of view. Sidgwick calls it the point of view of the universe. He doesn't mean that the universe is kind of a, a personal thing that has a point of view. He's just saying, try to put yourself in that position. Imagine the whole world. And then, he says, the good of any one individual is of no more important from that point of view than the good of any other. It's rather like what Bill and Melinda Gates came up with. Um, unless there are special grounds for believing that more good is likely to be realized in one case than in the other. So perhaps for some people you can achieve a great amount of good and for some people a lesser amount of good, then you ought to try to achieve the greater amount of good. doesn't mean that you should do the same for everyone. It will depend on the circumstances and how much good you can do. But everyone's well-being in itself counts equally. So we don't distinguish, as I was saying, between whether they're Americans or somewhere far away. Uh, we don't distinguish for that matter, and this is very relevant to questions like climate change, whether they're alive right now or whether they are still to be born but will come into the existence maybe in 50 years. Uh, their welfare is very important as well, and therefore the world into which they're born and to what extent they can achieve their welfare is equally important as the well-being of this existing generation. So that's the, I think, the, the key idea behind this. That is, and that's why it's altruism. It doesn't mean that we don't count our own welfare. It's not that kind of altruism that says we only should be concerned about others and not for ourselves, but rather that 
our well-being doesn't count for more as such than that of anyone else. This uh, is an idea, some suggestions about characteristic values of people in the effective altruism movement, um, which I picked up from Holden Karnofsky. I've mentioned GiveWell, and I'm going to say more about GiveWell. Holden is a co-founder of GiveWell, and he writes a very interesting blog, which you can find at givewell.org. And this particular one was about the value judgments that people in, generally in his organization and others in the effective altruism movement hold. So... They're cosmopolitans, I've already said that really, global humanitarians, that uh, uh, the death of a child in Malawi is as bad as the death of a child in uh, Chicago. Um, suffering and premature death are two bad things. Maybe there are other bad things, but they at least are things that are clearly bad. Um, the suffering of animals does matter. Um, as you've seen, some of the people are giving primarily to organizations trying to reduce animal suffering. Um, Holden just leaves this open. He says some of us think that uh, it matters less than human suffering, others don't, um, and certainly there are people in the effective altruism movement who have differing views on that question. Um, interestingly, he thinks that ideas like justice, equality, and fairness are not intrinsically important. What he means by that is they may be important because they may contribute to overall well-being, to avoiding things like suffering and premature death. And insofar as they do, they're important. But um, they are not important in themselves. So I guess what he's saying is that the people that he's encountered in the effective altruism movement would not sacrifice net well-being or not allow more suffering to occur overall because they wanted to adhere to some principle of justice or equality or fairness. Um, they would be things that are really seen as instrumental goods in terms of relieving suffering rather than intrinsic goods. And this is consistent with the idea that they're basically, basically the effective altruism movement is um, consequentialist, that is, it looks at the consequences of what we do and seeks to maximize expected value. It doesn't simply say things like do no harm it, um, or make sure you do some good. Effective altruism says you should maximize the amount of good you can do. You should do the most good you can. So um, a principle like do not harm, which some medical students are taught to be one of the core principles of medical ethics, a principle that says do, not, do no harm means that sometimes you're not going to maximize net good because sometimes you might have to do harm to some in order to do reduce harm for a number of others. And the consequentialist who wants to maximize will say, well, if we have to harm one in order to um, reduce harm, let's say by the same amount, but to many more people, um, then that might be the right thing to do. So as Holden describes it, this movement is broadly in the consequentialist, or you might be more familiar with the term utilitarian, ethical framework. Now, I don't think it has to be. I think one could well be an effective altruist, but say, I have some side constraints. What I want to do is I want to maximize uh, well-being, I want to minimize these things, suffering and premature death, but there are some things that I would not do in order to do that. So... It's certainly possible. It's certainly um, a, a, a variant of effective altruism to say uh, there are some things which, which, I, which we ought not to do, but within that constraint, as far as we can, we should be maximizing well-being. So I wouldn't take Holden's uh, description of this as authoritative. It's one version of it. Okay, so I've been talking about altruism. I've been talking about a number of people who are highly altruistic. I've been briefly talking about an underlying ethical basis for that. And I now want to talk a little bit about effectiveness. Why are we talking about effectiveness? Why does it matter? What does it actually mean? How do we assess it? 
So here's GiveWell, the organization that Holden Karnofsky co-founded with Ellie Hassenfeld. Um, and as I say, they do, they do research on effective charities. The reason that they do this, the reason that they got set up, they've only been going about six years, so it's a relatively new organization. Holden and Ellie were working for a hedge fund before the financial crisis. Um, they were making a lot of money, much more, they were quite young, they were in their 20s, but they were making much more money than they had expected to be making at that age, and they decided that they wanted to give some of it away. Or they had a lot more than they needed, that there were a lot of people less fortunate than they were, and that they ought to be helping them. Now, so they, they contacted a number of charities, a whole group of them, there were actually eight of them originally did this, and said, let's, let's each contact some charities in the area that you fa favour, and get some information about what they'll do if we give them a significant amount of money. Now, because they were working for hedge funds, they were used to doing a lot of analysis of companies that the hedge fund might invest in, finding out a lot of details about what these companies were doing, um, what their prospects were, and so on. When they contacted these charities, what did they get? Well, if you've ever contacted charities, you probably know. They got some nice glossy brochures showing, showing pictures of smiling children from a developing country um, saying, essentially, give to us, we'll help these kids. But no specifics about how much more good they could do per dollar or thousand dollars they were given. Uh, no indication of how much room for more funding they had with extra programs. No indication of what evaluation studies they conducted to show that their programs really worked and really changed what the organization was doing. That information was not available. What you can get from an organization called Charity Navigator, which already existed, is you can get information about how much they spend on administration and how much they spend on their programs, which Charity Navigator just took off forms that they submit to IRS. There's no independent checking. And essentially, that's a bookkeeping exercise. Nobody is really checking what you're going to write off as administration and what you're going to put down to programs. And even if that were the case, it's not really an indication that the programs are doing any good. You could have two organizations, one of which spent 20% of its income on administration and another which spent only 5% of its income on administration. But it may be that the organization that only spends 5% of its income on administration doesn't follow through with what happens to the money that it puts into the programs. Has no real knowledge of whether they're doing any good or not, so perhaps they're doing no good at all. Whereas the organization that spends 20% on administration has teams in the developing countries checking up that they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so they're actually might be 10 times as effective or even in an infinite number of times if the first program charity is doing no good at all. Um, even though they're spending more on administration. So the people who founded GiveWell were not satisfied with that. They wanted to do some serious research and get charities to be more transparent, to do more evaluation, and to really demonstrate what they're doing. And it's actually surprisingly hard to get them to be that transparent. Um, so if you look at the pie chart that is here, you see they've reviewed hundreds of charities, and at the moment they're recommending precisely three. Now, that doesn't mean that the other hundreds of charities they're not recommending are not doing good. Maybe they are, but they're not able to demonstrate that they're doing good in a sufficiently rigorous way to satisfy these former hedge fund analysts now running GiveWell. So that's why they're very rigorous. Some people argue that they're too strict. Um, but they are very rigorous in what they assess, and that's why I think if you want to give to an effective charity that is helping to reduce global poverty, go to Give Well, and you can be highly confident of their of the three charities they do recommend um, because they are so rigorous. And incidentally, although they started out looking at a whole lot of different charities, including ones that are working domestically in the United States, they decided that none of the domestic ones could really get near competing with the effective ones working to reduce global poverty. So that's why all of their 
highly rated charities are organisations working with the global poor. Okay, uh, Giving What We Can, which I mentioned, the organisation founded by Toby Ord, does something a little similar, um, although they don't have the staff and they haven't put as much, uh, many hours of work into recommending their charity and they tend to support the Give Well recommendations as well, but they are finding the best charities and you can go to that website. Um, and uh, they're also encouraging people to do more, to give more. Now, here's an example of the importance of effectiveness. On uh, this, side of the, this side of the picture, we have a sketch that is intended to represent a blind person with a guide dog. So if somebody asked you to give to an American charity that would provide blind dogs for, sorry, guide dogs for blind people, <laughs> you, would, you would no doubt think that this was a good charity. Um, but that's a good thing to do. Obviously helps blind people to become more independent um, and that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, and of course it is a good thing. I'm not denying that it's a good thing to train guide dogs for blind people. But it is quite expensive. In fact, it costs around $40,000 to train a dog to be a guide for a blind person and to train the blind person to live with the dog and to use the dog. So it's quite an expensive program. I mentioned earlier that Toby Ord calculated that with the amount of money that he was going to earn in his lifetime, he could prevent or cure 80,000 cases of blindness. What he was thinking of, uh, there are a couple of things, ways of doing this. One is doing cataract surgery, which of course nobody in this country is blind because they have cataracts. It's a simple operation, easy to remove a cataract. But even more cost effective is preventing a condition called trachoma, which is the largest single cause of preventable blindness in the world. Um, it's a condition that exists in developing countries. It's a, uh, a microorganism that gets in people's eyes, often when they're young, um, and gradually uh, their vision gets cloudy over maybe 15 years, 15 to 20 years, and typically they will then go blind when they're around 40. Um, they might then have another 20 years of, on average of life when they're blind. Now this can be cured, can be prevented um, if treated early um, at a very, very inexpensively. Estimates vary between 20, 000, sorry, between $20 and $50 per case of blindness prevented if you treat people with trachoma. So you do the calculations for the $40,000 that will provide one person with a guide dog in the United States, you could save something between 800 and 2,000 people becoming blind. And I think clearly preventing somebody becoming blind is an even better thing to do than giving a person who is blind a guide dog. So when you multiply it by the numbers, it's an indication of how important it is to make sure that if you're donating to charity, you're donating to a highly effective one. Um, something similar happens for animal charities. If, if you're concerned about animal suffering, there is a much newer website called Effective Animal Activism that recommends a couple of charities as most effective. I, the calculations here are, are more difficult because we're talking about, we're comparing very different things, very different activities and different species even that we might be helping. So uh, I wouldn't place uh, complete confidence in the calculations that we have, but if you are interested in effective, uh, giving to an effective animal charity, this is certainly a good place to start. Now, um, what I want to do just briefly is to indicate to you why this approach about effectiveness is really a, such a revolutionary step against the background of what happens in the charity sector today. As you might think, what I'm saying is pretty obvious. Isn't it obvious that we all want to get the best value for our money? And wouldn't that apply to charity as well? But this is from the web page of one of the biggest philanthropy advisors, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, um, who essentially, as it says here, 
Their goal is to help donors, families, individuals, families, trusts and foundations create thoughtful, effective giving programs. So obviously they're advising people with plenty of money um, and they say somewhere on the website that uh, about $3.2 billion has gone to charities uh, through their advice as a result of people that they've been advising. So this is no small um, uh, organisation that is um, just sort of not careful in what it's doing. They're, uh, they're at the top of the particular industry of charity advice. Okay, so what kind of advice do they say? They have a, a brochure, a PDF you can download called Finding Your Focus in Philanthropy. And if you look at that, it pictures the field of philanthropy like this, this little chart. Now, I've been talking a bit about global poverty, haven't I? As, and GiveWell, as I said, thinks that that's clearly the most effective way in which to give, at least if you're helping humans. Well, where do you find global poverty, uh, reducing global poverty here? It's, it's not in any obvious place. Of course, some of it might be economic security, but that lumps together providing economic security for people in the United States or other developed countries and the developing world countries. Um, education, yes, providing education for people in developing countries is a good thing, but you can bet that most of the money that is under the education label is people giving to their colleges in the United States. Human and civil rights, well, certainly the poor need some uh, human rights, but again, that's not specific. So it's certainly de-emphasized in this chart, which is one thing that you wonder about. But this is the underlying philosophy, if you can call it that, um, which I find most troubling. Um, well, sorry, this is just a question. Let me come to the next slide. So, so this is a question, which is an important question, I guess. What is the most urgent issue? And this is what I meant to say before. Um, this is, this is the, the view that they take. There's obviously no objective answer to that question. Well, is that really so obvious? I don't think it's obvious at all. In fact, I think it's not only not obvious, but it's false. And this is why. So this is a painting by the medieval Italian painter Duccio. It's known as the Stroganoff Madonna, because it's a Madonna and child, obviously, and it was owned by uh, somebody called Stroganoff for many years. It came on the market um, a few years ago, and it was purchased by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, which approached several donors for special donations to enable them to purchase it. And it cost $45 million. So it's now, you can go and see it if you go to New York. It's now in the Met. It's a rather small painting, in fact. Um, and it's also behind this kind of perspex case, I guess, or glass case to protect it. The question is, is it obvious that there was no better use for $45 million than to add this painting to the already very rich collection at the Met? You have to ask, how much good does it do to have this at the Met? Because after all, if it hadn't been at the Met, no doubt it would have been somewhere else. Maybe it would have been here in Chicago. Um, maybe it would have been in London or Paris or who knows where it would have been. Um, but you can be sure that it wasn't going to be left out in the rain anyway. Um, so it's not that I'm talking about neglecting the treasures of Western cultural heritage. It's a matter of saying, how much does this add to the experiences of people going to the Met that they can see this painting along with the other paintings that we have, and what else could you have done with that amount of money? Well, here's the trachoma example again. These uh, young people are lined up at a clinic to be treated with trachoma, for trachoma. Um, you could, uh, if indeed it's right, that for 45, uh, that I, I said roughly the estimates vary from 20 to 50, uh, dollars for per case of trachoma prevented by setting up clinics like these in developing countries. Let's assume, for the, make the math very easy for us, 
that the actual cost is $45 per case of blindness prevented, then the cost of the Duccio would have prevented a million cases of blindness. I think it's very, very hard indeed to see that um, the enhancement of the experience of people at the Met, even over many years, could be as significant as preventing a million people becoming blind and therefore not only being unable to see works of art, but being unable to see anything at all. And since they're mostly poor people in developing countries, also very likely being unable to earn anything or to fend for themselves and having to depend on help from family and friends who are already probably also very poor. So that's the kind of comparison that I think we ought to make and I think we ought to reject the view that it's all just subjective, whether you give to arts and culture and museums or whether you give to helping people in global poverty. Okay, I said I'm going to allow some time for questions. So my last section is something about um, what kind of a person does effective altruism demand. Um, I already showed you some of the people, but um, do they have, is there something special about them? Is there something rare about them that uh, the rest of us don't have? Uh, are they thinking in a different way to the way the rest of us do? So that's the issue that I want to say a little bit about. So there's a philosopher called Susan Wolf, who wrote an article called Moral Saints um, about 30 years ago. Um, and uh, she said, she, she described what she saw as, as being a moral saint and said that it doesn't constitute a model of personal well-being towards which it would be particularly rational, good, or desirable for a human being to strive. Her basic idea was that uh, moral saints are going to be so focused on doing what's good, on doing the right thing, that um, they're going to be no fun at all to be with. They're not going to be the kind of person that you would want to have as your friend, let alone as your spouse or partner or anything of that sort. Um, they were just going to go through life with this one mission and they were actually probably going to be fairly self-righteous and uh, uh, kind of moralistic, hectoring in terms of what they were doing. Um, so the question that I'm asking is, is this the kind of thing that a person who's involved in effective altruism is likely to be? And uh, is it something that we might think, therefore, as not a desirable personal ideal to follow? Well, I don't think it is. And I don't think the people uh, who I showed before, um, I haven't met all of the people I've showed, but I've met many of them and uh, quite a few others, think of life in that way at all. I think a lot of them find what they're doing to be rewarding and fulfilling and to leave them with time for having fun of various kinds as well. To Toby Ord, let's say, to take the first one, um, start, uh, says that he has a really good quality of life, um, that he has everything he really needs. Um, he can live on uh, that uh, 18,000 pounds a year. Uh, he can still take some holidays and travel a bit on holidays and so on, uh, uh, really enjoy what he's doing, and in addition, have the fulfillment of knowing that he's making a major impact for good on the world. So let me develop this idea a little bit further using a book by a Canadian philosopher called Richard Keshin called Reasonable Self-Esteem. So Keshin starts out with the idea of, uh, which makes I think an interesting contrast to um, Susan Wolf's idea, of a reasonable person. Um, a person who, he, he says, Defining commitment is to have reasonable beliefs about the world, so not to believe things for which there aren't good reasons, and about what is in his or her interests, so not to neglect his or her interests, and about what she ought to do. Well, can you get from this notion to anything about what you ought to do? So, Keshen thinks, yes, Keshen thinks, if you want to have self-esteem and I don't need to tell people in the United States that self-esteem is an important part of well-being. We'll have these self-esteem programs, probably from kindergarten on, um, to uh, make sure that you have sufficient self-esteem, that uh, people react to you in ways that don't uh, 
harm your self-esteem from for people like me who come from outside the United States. There's something slightly amusing, I have to say, about the, the deliberateness of promoting everybody's self-esteem. But I'm not saying that self-esteem isn't, isn't a good thing, isn't an important thing to have. But what does it really take to have real self-esteem? Um, not just people telling you that you're terrific, but um, knowing that um, you are not ignoring the interests of others whose well-being you recognize as equally significant. No, that recognizes equally significant. It goes back to the quote from Henry Sidgwick that I gave you before. A reasonable person can appreciate that there is a point of view that is not just my point of view, not just a point of view that comes out of me and focuses on me and therefore on the people that I care about, myself, my family, my close friends, but that there is a point of view that looks at others and says, well, everyone is somebody's son or daughter. Um, you know, everybody has other people who are their friends who care about them. And that matters as my children matter and as my friends matter. And so from that point of view, I can't ignore their interests. Or if I do, I can't really look myself in the face and say, um, I'm living the way I ought to be living. So that's something that you can have self-esteem if, if you're doing that to a reasonable extent. Again, not necessarily carrying it to the last possible way, not necessarily going as far as some of the people I showed you, Zell Kravinsky and Alex Berger and Chris Croy, who have taken that as far as donating a kidney. Um, I'm not saying that's required. I still have two kidneys, full disclosure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I think that um, people draw their lines at different places and you can have reasonable grounds for drawing your lines at different places. Um, but you need to think, I am doing something significant about this. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do some good for the world. And that can be satisfying. So I'm just going to close with these two quotes. Um, this is Alex Berger, whom you saw before, who works for GiveWell and donated a kidney. Um, he referred in a statement to um, my own arguments about obligations to give to the global poor and said at first it felt like a painful imposition. When you think, well, that can't be any fun, feeling that you've got this painful duty imposed on you. But thinking about it more and starting to take it up as a way of living, um, he's seen it as something that he's deeply committed to and that actually makes him feel that his own life is much more rewarding. And I'll close with someone else who um, unfortunately is no longer with us but was a pioneer of the American animal movement, uh, a man called, oh, I thought I had his name. Oops, that's really odd, sorry. On my laptop, he had his name. His name is Henry Spira. Um, he was, I, I would say he was the single most effective activist in the 20th century American animal movement. He died just at, towards the end of the century in 1998. Um, if you go to a store and pick up some kind of cosmetic or hair shampoo and it has the words on it, not tested on animals, you've really got to thank Henry for the campaign that made that possible. Previously, they all were tested on animals. Um, and there are a number of other things that he did. I won't go into doing it. But... Um, because I'd known Henry for many years and admired both what he did as an activist and his general attitude to life, um, I'd for a long time had a plan to write something about him so that other people could follow his methods and learn from him. Um, back in 1997, I was, was in Australia then, it was before I'd come to Princeton, I got a phone call from him saying, um, Peter, do you still want to write something about me and what I do? Uh, and I said, yes, sure. He said, well, maybe you should come soon. I said, why? He said, because my doctors have told me that I've got cancer and I probably only have six months to live. In fact, he lived somewhat longer than that. But um, I did go and talk to him and I recorded uh, a lot of interviews with him. And what really struck me, apart from the, obviously, the things about how he'd worked, which I thought was important to help other activists realize how you can change the world, but the thing that was important was his equanimity in the face of his own mortality. Um, and that was because he really felt satisfied with what he had done. And this is just a quote from one of the things that uh, he said at that time, that uh, you want to 
I guess basically one wants to look back and think that one's done the best one can to make this a better place for others. It's not a sense of duty, but rather this is what I want to do, I feel best when I'm doing it well. And he contrasted that with the lives that he thought a lot of his fellow Americans were living, where basically their goal was just to consume more, to earn more, to consume more, to earn more so you could consume more still, and really what you left behind was a large pile of trash of what you'd consumed, and he thought that would not be a satisfying way of living, but the way he'd lived, he felt he'd done his part, and if he was going to die in a few months, then so be it. And I think um, there is something in that, that uh, you can feel a sort of satisfaction and fulfillment, uh, even in the face of death, but um, obviously you don't have to be at that point in order to feel that you're doing something worthwhile with your life. And a lot of the people who are effective altruists have told me that there is great joy for them in knowing that they are doing something important and that they are making a difference in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have an opportunity for uh, questions, uh, lots to chew on here. Who would like to kick things off? And there's a microphone here, so if you can signal so that other people can hear your question, there's one right over there. Uh, so arguably, if Bill, Gates had not, if Bill Gates had not reinvested his capital and uh, kind of saved and worked on Microsoft, um, um, I, I've been told I'm supposed to repeat the questions anyway because we're recording this, so, okay. you know, yeah, so, I can hear you anyway. Uh, so, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so if Bill Gates had not reinvested his capital uh, in his uh, passion and instead given away to charity, arguably he could not have been in the position he is now to give so much money. Uh, so how do you justify saving money and reinvesting and working for progress in that regard um, instead of donating consistently all the time. Right. So the question is if, if Bill Gates had uh, not invested the money he had made early on but had given it away, then he would have had vastly less money to be able to give away later on. So how can one justify that given what I've been saying? I think if you are or have some chance of being the next Bill Gates or perhaps the next Warren Buffett because this would apply to him too, um, then certainly you should reinvest and build up. Um, I think that's a perfectly sensible strategy. Um, you might still think that it's not going to make any real difference to your prospects of uh, success if you give away some of what you've got, maybe a small percentage, because um, I think it's actually good to get into the habit of giving from an earlier age. I think it's it's... Sometimes some people find it harder to make the leap to giving something significant if they haven't been giving and they're you know, into their 30s or 40s or something like that. Um, but certainly, you know, yes, if you're going to be successful and you need the working capital in order to be successful or you have a good chance of being successful, it's perfectly reasonable to say, I am going to give, but I think I'll be able to give a lot more and do a lot more good if I don't give now. Um, the, the danger, of course, is that you'll get sucked into the lifestyle. I've talked to Matt Wagi, the ex-student of mine who has gone into finance in New York, and I said, how can you be sure that working with other people who live in glamorous apartments in Tribeca or drive Ferraris or whatever else it might be, you're not going to feel that, oh, well, I really need a Ferrari. You know, you can't manage with something less. Um, so he said to me, well, one thing that I'm doing is I'm telling people publicly about what I've pledged to do, um, that I've pledged to give. His, his, his specific pledge is to give half of what he earns to, um, to effective organisations. So I'm telling people, I'm, I'm asking them to remind me if I start to slip back, in fact to shame me if I do. So uh, if you're prepared to do that, prepared to say, look, I'm investing this now so that I'll have more to give, but I want you to come back and remind me that that's what I'm doing and don't let me get sucked into that kind of high uh, elite lifestyle, then I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, 
Okay, I... Can you turn? Okay. Um, I have, in fact, a few uh, thoughts, and uh, one is a question. Uh, the fact that there are billions of people all over the world who really need uh, uh, donations and need to be supported, uh, in my view, uh, that is because the systems where they live are sick systems. And, and uh, the, the question which I have is, uh, uh, should the altruism be directed not only to treat uh, symptoms of those uh, sick systems, but also try to, to a attempt to, uh, to cure those systems. And that is including United States. Uh, so uh, this is my, my question, uh, because we, I see them that mostly uh, the symptoms are treated. Yeah, not okay. I, I have the question. So, okay. so you're suggesting that the fact that uh, a billion or more people are living in poverty is due to the fact that there are sick systems in the world, as you put it, and shouldn't we therefore be trying to treat the causes of poverty rather than the symptoms, which the organizations that I'm referred to um, are in fact doing? Well, um, I think we, there are a range of factors that lead to people being in poverty. I'm sure that you, know, you refer to sick systems which could range from something like the global economic order, which um, I think one can reasonably feel is not equitable to developing nations in various ways, um, or particular governments in particular developing countries, which may be corrupt or oppressive um, and may cause poverty as well. That may be a factor. There may also be other factors. I mean, there are studies that show that sometimes geography is a factor in poverty, that countries that are landlocked, for example, and have poor neighbours, um, do not have easy access to trade and they tend to be poorer than countries that are, are on the sea um, and that can trade more easily. Um, so there, I think there are a range of factors. We don't fully know all of the factors. Um, and therefore it's, it's hard to know how much difference we're going to make by trying to change some of these systems. I would certainly say, if you take the world economic order, I would certainly like to change that. I would like to, just to take one example of it, end agricultural subsidies from the rich nations which impoverish peasant farmers in developing countries where agriculture is their major industry but they can't sell on the world market at decent prices because the United States and the European Union subsidize their agricultural producers. So if we could end that, it would create new markets for millions of poor farmers. I would think that would be an excellent thing to do. The question is, how do you do it, right? I mean, we have the Farm Bill in the United States, which uh, every time it comes up for renewal, people say, this is a waste of money. Why are we subsidizing these uh, farmers, most of whom are already quite wealthy anyway? Um, but every time, nevertheless, it gets passed. Um, and, you know, it will be interesting to see whether those people in Congress who have been so adamant that the government should slash spending will be prepared to start with a farm bill and slash the sub subsidies that hurt the global poor. I really wonder if they will. So, um, yeah, I'd support, you know, if somebody says, I'm, I'm not going to give to one of those Give Well charities, I'm going to give to an organisation that's lobbying to stop agricultural subsidies that hurt the global poor, I'd say, go ahead. Um, that's a good thing to do. I think it's a, it's a high-risk attempt to improve the position of the global poor because it's unlikely that you're going to succeed. But if you did succeed, if you were contributing to the success of such a bill, you would help millions of people. So it's a high-risk, high-payoff strategy, whereas giving to provide bed nets for children in malaria-prone parts of the world is a low-risk, relatively low-payoff strategy. You may save some lives, but you certainly won't save millions of lives unless you've got as much money as Gates or Buffett. Terrific. Right here in the middle, please. please. We're trying to get the mic to you. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks so much. This was really interesting. Um, so I subscribe to this belief, and... Um, 
you know, I have a mathematician as a husband, so I told him figure out the most effective place, and he found GiveWell, and we gave to that organization that was up there uh, against malaria, and it was great. But um, my mom doesn't have breast cancer. Um, my dad wasn't a Vietnam vet with PTSD. I was raised an atheist, and I don't have um, a strong emotional connection really to any particular charity like breast cancer. And I imagine a lot of people in this room do, and that they probably give to that because maybe their mother or close person in their life suffered from that. And I wonder um, if that speaks to sort of different motivations that people have when they give to charity. I don't think, you know, to some degree it seems like you're almost assuming that everyone has the same motivation of wanting to um, make the biggest difference, but maybe they don't, right? Maybe they have other motivations. And so kind of academically I'm wondering, is it useful to think about those different motivations? And then more pragmatically I'm, I wonder, what do you suggest doing, or how would you talk to those people um, and try and convince them more okay. of this? Yeah. Okay, so you're suggesting that um, many people have more personal motivations for giving, that, for example, many people say things like, my mom or my wife got breast cancer, so I'm going to give to research to try to prevent breast cancer, um, or in some other way they will give in a sense that is personal rather than that is seeking to maximize the amount of good you can do overall impersonally with the amount you give. And you're asking how should one address that kind of giving which has a rather different motivation from what I'm talking about. Well, I agree that it has a different motivation. Um, and I suppose I would try and say two things. One is um, I would say to that person, is the fact that your mum had breast cancer, obviously a sad thing, um, is that a reason why you should donate to a cause where your dollars are going to clearly do less good than with some other condition? Because I think that's breast cancer is a good example where there's a large amount of money going into that area precisely because a lot of women get it, and a lot of people therefore want to support it because someone that they loved had it. But, um, you know, and we, we make some progress with understanding breast cancer and um, preventing it or treating it when it occurs. But, um, you know, there's a statistic that's often quoted, and I can't really vouch entirely for its accuracy, but it's probably <laughs> roughly right, that says that 90% of the medical research dollars are spent to treat or cure or prevent 10% of the global burden of disease. And the reason for that is that they're spent either by, in countries, affluent countries like the United States, uh, by governments that are responding to the health needs of their populace, their populations, or they're spent by drug companies that are looking for markets. And for drug companies, it's not very useful to develop a, disease, uh, a treatment for a disease that might affect many millions of people, but none of them can afford to pay for the drugs that you want to produce. So there's no market there. So um, that's why I think you get much better value, even if you're just focusing on treating and preventing diseases, by looking at that, those diseases that are killing more people and which we're really not treating. So I would try to make that point and say, wouldn't you want at least some of this money to go where it is going to do the most good to everyone, not just to people who have the same disease that your mother had? The other thing I would say is, if you do want to think of this gift, the Breast Cancer Foundation gift, as something personal, then how about thinking of your charitable donations as being in, in two separate piles. So on the one hand, there are things that you do personally because they matter to you in some particular personal way. And the breast cancer donation will go there. And if you want to give to your local art institute um, and you think you know, that would be a nice thing to do because then you get invited to swanky dinners at the institute, um, so, you know, think of that as something that's also in a rather different, there's a specific personal payoff in being a significant donor to your local museum or, or uh, art, art gallery. Um, but then have another 
set of charitable gifts where you are giving in the way that you suggested that you and your husband are doing, that is that you look at where you can have the maximum amount of impact, where you get the best value from the dollars that you give. And, um, and you know, eventually you'll sort out your own distribution between those two separate areas of giving. On this side of the room, why don't we right here? Okay, so what you're asking really is um, you understand that it's better to treat a million people uh, rather than one, but um, you're questioning whether we can say that it's better to prevent one person going blind from trachoma uh, than to give one blind person a guide dog. Is that right? Okay, so uh, you're struggling with the idea that it's better to prevent someone going blind than to help someone who is already, already is blind, right? Yeah. But I wasn't really arguing that that is the case if we're just considering one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I was, I think all I said, certainly all I meant to say anyway, um, was that it would be hard to say that it's not as good to treat to prevent somebody going blind, as it is to help somebody who is already blind to have a guide dog specifically, right? Now, um, so I'm not sure how I can convince you of that. I suppose I can only ask each one of you to imagine yourselves in those situations and ask what you think. You know, let, let's suppose that um, you know, we play this game that John Rawls plays in uh, the beginning of A Theory of Justice, where he says, you imagine that there is a veil of ignorance that comes down when we make these choices about the kind of society we're going to live in. We don't know if we're going to be rich or poor, or black or white, or male or female, or uh, highly intelligent or not so bright, or, or whatever. And then we choose a just society on the basis of what we would choose, not knowing which category we're going to be in. So maybe you could do something like that here. You could say, so imagine that you're going to be uh, either a person who will become blind um, uh, but that could be prevented or a person who is blind and could get a guide dog in order to help them. Um, and if you could choose one or the other, you know, would it make a big difference? And you know, some of you might think, well, I'd rather choose not to be blind at all and some of you might think I'd rather choose to have the guide dog. But you know, my guess is that Nobody is going to say, well, it's clearly not only better, but many times better to get the guide dog than it is to not go blind. And because of the way the, the costs turn out, right, that's why I think the costs are so important, it would have to be many, many times better. Even on the higher cost estimate for preventing trachoma, it would have to be 800 times better to uh, get the guide dog than to uh, be prevented from going blind because that's the cost differential, right? So it could be 800 people. So um, I think it's clearly not 800 times better uh, to give the, the guide dog to the blind person. Now you might say, well, does that mean that the guide dog never gets, sorry, the blind person never gets a guide dog? Um, and I say, I would say as long as there are people who we can prevent going blind for one eight hundredth of the cost of training the guide dog, yes, unfortunately that's, true. It's, it's sad for the blind person who never gets the guide dog, but of course it's also, if, if you do spend the money on the guide dog, then it's sad for the 800 people who are going to go blind. Okay. Terrific. Um, let's see, right here, please. Oh, right. Either way. The was... microphone's coming behind you. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, you briefly mentioned um, that this idea of well-being among various people's lives is an equality for all people, including people in the future. 
the future generations. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how you would apply this analysis to something like environmental work, which it's much less clear um, what exactly the outcomes of mm -hmm. your donation would be and how you could quantify that, especially since a lot of what we've talked about um, when we were talking about charitable organizations is based on um, sort of their ability to demonstrate the good that they're doing and how that impacts people's lives directly. Yeah, right. So that's a good question. You're asking about given that I said that we ought to have equal concern for people in the future, how do we how do we evaluate the benefits done by environmental programs, which very often will affect people in the future, and also where the outcome is less certain as to what exactly it's going to be. So I think that that, um, depending on the nature of the program, may also be like the question we had earlier on about trying to change the, the six systems that exist in the world. Um, that is, it, some of these things will also be much more risky but, um, much more speculative, but possibly have a really big payoff. And I, I agree, incidentally, you know, I, I mentioned there are some people who have some criticisms of GiveWell as being very narrow. Um, they do demand really hard evidence, and that means that they exclude charities, which of their nature, you can't really get that hard evidence. So it's very hard, for example, suppose you have a charity that is trying to work on ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That seems a really important thing to do, both in terms of global poverty, because climate change will have a, a huge effect on the global poor, and in terms of preserving endangered species and preserving historical treasures and so on, because sea levels rising will inundate them, and so on and so on. But how do you know you're really going to be able to make a difference? You know, it's a bit like how do you know you're going to be able to stop agricultural subsidies? Um, it's, it's hard, but if you have a if you have a good strategy and you say, look, you know, I have this evidence that we can make a difference in this way and that this will reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and there's good scientific evidence that that will lead to this and this, um, I think that's a, that could be a reasonable thing to do. It's, uh, it's always going to be a matter of how good is the evidence, uh, what do you think you're going to achieve, what's the payoff, and how does that compare with the smaller but more certain payoffs in the other charities. Terrific. Uh, a final question right back here. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for talking to us. Um, I, was, I just wanted to ask you, um, it occurred to me that it seems like one of the most important components of effective altruism would be uh, attempting to convince as many other people as possible that this is uh, a, the best philosophy to follow for an ethical life. Um, do you think that there is a specific set of practices that one should follow in doing that? Obviously, you've dedicated your life, um, or made a portion of your life, to, to sort of spreading the, the word. Um, uh, do you think that there is a specific set of practices that one should follow, or is it best just left to everyone's um, own sort of uh, uh, inclinations about how they try to convince others that this is also right. important. So you're, you're asking about advocacy of the kinds of issues that I've talked about, which clearly can make a difference, and do I have particular recommendations for trying to spread the message that I've been talking about? Um, I think you're right that uh, advocacy can, can be very important. In fact, um, I referred to Will McCaskill, who set up 80,000 hours, um, and... Uh, advises various kinds of ethical careers. And uh, somebody once asked him at a talk I heard him give, so um, why are you still in philosophy? Why aren't you in finance earning a lot of money trying to, um, so that you can give a lot of it away? And he said, well, um, I've already convinced a number of people to do exactly that. So, um, you know, it's, like, it's, it's almost like a pyramid scheme. If I can convince five people to um, go into finance, then I've done five times as much good as if I'd gone into finance and convinced no one. And if each of those five people would then convince more, of course it would, be, would spread out even more. So I do think this is a very important and useful thing to do. Um, and there are ways you can do it. You can uh, join some of these organizations uh, which are giving what we can, the life you can save, 80,000 hours. Uh, they all have uh, chapters or groups on campuses and in uh, various cities. Uh, and online, so you can join with them and help to spread the message that way. Um, 
you can certainly decide to make that an occupation if you can support yourself uh, in some way um, by promoting the idea and some people have donated to some of these organizations so that they can hire people who can do that because they think that that's a highly cost effective thing to do. Um, in some of the specific sub areas that I've talked about there are certainly people who do that as a volunteer. For instance I referred to effective animal activism. Um, one of their top charities is an organization called Vegan Outreach which has volunteers who hand out leaflets about the benefits of a vegan diet. Um, and they've got data which shows, I can't remember the figures, that, and they do it online as well, that for every number of leaflets that you hand out or every number of hits you get on the website, um, a certain number of people become vegan, which will reduce animal suffering, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, protect the environment, uh, and so on. So there are a variety of different ways in which you can be an advocate, but I totally agree if you think that what I've been saying is along the right lines, um, somewhere talking to others about it, communicating to others, telling them what you're doing, not being too shy to say, uh, I give away some of my income to effective causes, uh, is a very important part of this. Thank you very much for your questions and your attention. Before, before I let you go, before I let you go, let me just um, thank Peter for starting a conversation. The number of hands that were still up indicates that there are a lot more talking that people want to do on this subject, and hopefully you will turn to one another and continue this conversation. I also want to just flag a couple of one-book events that are coming up um, that in many ways extend the conversation. Uh, there's a photo contest for any of you Northwestern students who want to uh, show uh, photographs that move people and motivate people for change. Also, on November 12th, um, there is a screening of a film called Girl Rising, which spotlights the importance of educating young women uh, for global development, and that will be in the McCormick Auditorium uh, and Campus Drive. Uh, please join me in thanking Peter once again for a stimulating talk. <laughs>